Well, greetings, test takers. This is uh, Dean Tenney coming to you from my studio here in a fabulous Las Vegas. Uh, Going to do a little carve out. Well, I shouldn't say carve out, separate lecture on a balance sheet and an income statement. Uh, I have explicated in the FINRA content outline for Series 7 the particulars about a balance sheet, financial statements, income statement for the Series 7 exam. I've also explicated that in the Series 65 explication of NASA's test specifications, and I've done the same for Series uh, 66. However, I thought it might be uh, helpful to have a separate kind of a discussion um, self-contained about uh, balance sheet and income statement for test purposes. So uh, people are saying that they're seeing questions where they're giving the ledger entries, you know, the entries here and having to deal with it as a whole rather than piecemeal, like, you know, what is, you know, working capital. So let's just go through this uh, balance sheet and talk about some of the things you might encounter uh, on your exam. Now, this is testable on two levels. What I mean by that is we should have a general understanding of a balance sheet as it relates to a corporation, as we see here, uh, as well as a balance sheet for a customer, right, where we go through it. And by the way, when you get lost, that's what I would suggest you think of it as, is like, you know, your personal balance sheet, uh, you know, as compared to, you know, corporate, it's very similar. Anyways, a balance sheet is a picture in time. So let's just say this is the end of the third quarter. So let me just get my annotation tool fired up here. And let's say we're looking at this balance sheet as of September 30th, 2022. So this was the state of affairs. Now, as a uh, issuer, you're going to report this information quarterly, three 10Qs and a 10K. The 10K is the fourth quarter as well as the year-end results. You're going to file that uh, those 10Qs and a 10K. The 10K is audited uh, with the SEC, the Market Center, NASDAQ, or New York, and, and most importantly, to your customers. Right. So this is as of September 30th, 2022. So the end of the third quarter. So let's go over to the uh, classical balance sheet equation. Classical meaning we think everybody knows it. Assets minus liabilities equals net worth is the way I like to think of it. And this balance sheet, 100 million minus 46 and a half million equals 53 and a half million. That's why it balances. Uh, you know, uh, however, you know, uh, you could also think of it as why it balances assets equals liabilities plus net worth. So let's just uh, put that in. Whoa, sorry about that. Let me get that. Boom. And, uh, you know, here's the big equal sign that I put in the uh, thumbnail, basically, right? Boom. That's how it balances. All right. So let's look at the asset side of the balance sheet first. Current assets are cash or things you plan to turn to cash within 12 months, right? So if I ask, what are your current assets? I'm asking, what is your cash and things you intend to turn to cash within 12 months? So here we have uh, 5 million, the corporation has 5 million as of today, this picture at this time, 5 million in cash, 10 million in accounts receivable. So again, you can think of your personal situation. If I you know, I have a two-tier pricing thing for tutoring. If you use my booking page, it bills you immediately, and I don't have to send you an invoice, and it's a lot less hassles. If you want to be invoiced, I charge you a higher fee, and let's say that uh, I have an account receivable, meaning, you know, I've delivered to you tutoring, and you haven't paid me, and you owe me 2000 bucks. That's an account receivable, right? That's $2,000 I plan on collecting uh, within 12 months. Inventory. So we have $15 million in inventory and we plan on uh, selling the inventory. We plan on turning the inventory to cash within 12 months. Now, one thing we should be aware of is we don't want to have to turn our inventory into cash uh, quickly. You know, we want to be able to get our margin. And so one thing we might be interested in is what is the quick assets of this corporation? The quick assets, let me get a smaller font. Uh, I chose a bigger balance sheet, even though I know it's going to give me less room to uh, make my notes to it, just because I know that some of you are using, you know, smartphones or whatever you're using. So hopefully you can see this a little better, but current assets are the uh, quick assets are current inventory, uh, excuse me, current assets, I need another cup of coffee here, <laughs> let me get another cup, <laughs> cheers. 
got to get that caffeine going. Anyways, current assets minus inventory. So in this example, in this example, we uh, took that and uh, we would find out our quick assets. Let me get a different color. It is going to be uh, 15 million, right? Because we've got current assets of 30. We've got inventory of 15. And so we would have quick assets of 15 million. All right, so our fixed assets, our long-term assets, these are fixed or long-term assets, things we don't plan on turning into cash within 12 months. Our buildings, our furniture, uh, land. So we have total fixed assets uh, of 70 million. Intangibles are goodwill, uh, you know, patents, things like that. You know, what is the golden arches of McDonald's worth? We don't really know. So, you know, when we're calculating book value, for example, theoretical liquidation value of the business, we usually don't use the intangibles. However, those are those are real numbers. Like, you know, for example, in social media, I go by Series 7 Guru as my social media handle. That's an intangible. What is that worth in the marketplace? Who knows, right? It's a brand, basically. So those are uh, intangibles, uh, goodwills, patents, things like that. Uh, you know, again, <laughs> if I were going to finagle my balance sheet, and I want to be, you know, I could say that, that my intangible, my goodwill from Series 7 Guru is worth a million, 10 million. You know, I could say it depends on what day I wake up. Sometimes I think it's worthless. But anyways, uh, we have 100 million on the uh, asset side. All right, so let's go over to our liabilities and net worth. Uh, current liabilities are things I plan on paying within 12 months. So accounts payable, you know, in my example, if you're going to use your personal kind of situation, we're looking at a corporation, but again, we should be able to kind of have a general understanding as it relates to a corporation or an individual. In my situation, I, you know, I pay a lot of things, um, subscriptions. You know, I pay Google to make the advertising go bye-bye. I pay, you know, Reddit to make the advertising go bye-bye. I subscribe to uh, StreamYard for my, our Tuesday live streams, uh, you know, uh, uh, so on and so forth. I have an automatic uh, booking page called Setmore that I pay them. So, you know, my subscriptions, I owe people, uh, through the year or several thousand dollars. And so those are things I plan on paying within 12 months. Uh, wages, that's what you owe your employees. Uh, taxes, what you owe the IRS. And so we have total current liabilities of six and a half million. Now, one thing we do uh, ask on the test is both recognition and practical application is working capital. And working capital is the current assets. I'm going to take this down here. Working capital is the current assets minus the current liabilities. And so here in our example, the working capital is going to be uh, 30 million in current assets. minus uh, 6.5 million. Uh, a lot of times it's recognition more than it's actually, can you do the math? Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes they just ask you to pick the formula out of the lineup. So I'll just call this A, for example, in terms of recognition, you know, which of the following best describes working capital. So a lot of times they're not asking you to actually, you know, do the math, just what does it look like? Again, I'm terrible at arithmetic, so I'm going to get out my calculator to do the math. So 30 million uh, minus minus uh, six and a half million. Do, 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 do equals uh, 23 and a half million. So let's put that there. Put that in green. Now, you know, on a really bad draw, they might ask you the effects that different things have on working capital. So, you know, for example, uh, our working capital here is 23 million. And let me put a dollar sign there.
You know, and uh, if we declare a dividend, for example, if we declare a dividend, for example, a dividend declared by the board becomes a current liability, right? So if we have a current liability, that would cause working capital to decrease. So declaration of a dividend, let's just put that, of a dividend would cause a fall in a, a decrease in working capital. And let's put that uh, different colors. Now, be careful what you're being asked. You know, what I mean by be careful what you're being asked is because when we pay the dividend, there is no effect. What I mean by that is, right, if you, you pay your bills, if I ask what is your working capital, your current assets, minus your current liabilities, and you sit down to pay a bill, like let's say I'm going to write a check to pay my phone bill. My, you know, my cash went down by the exact same man man manner my liability went down. So be careful about whether you're being asked about the declared date, working capital decreases, or whether you're being asked about the payable date where there is no effect on uh, working capital. Okay, so what else could we ask you in terms of uh, balance sheet entries and what affects working capital? As you see here, at one point in time, we sold $40 million worth of bonds. Right. And so if we sell securities, stock or bonds, that would cause working capital to go up. Right. Because we would have uh, in that 50 million bond, 40 million dollars worth of bonds we sold. That's going to be cash received from the proceeds of the bond offering. And then that will not show up in current liabilities. It will show up in long term liabilities. So, you know, if we uh, raise money, equity or debt capital, uh, that would cause working capital to increase. Right. So those are the kind of questions you could be asked about the effect that certain transactions would have on the balance sheet. Right. And that would be a primary transaction. All right. So that would be what we call our, our working capital. A, another, let me just clear up the screen. Another thing you could ask about is a current ratio. The current ratio is the current liabilities excuse me, current assets divided by current liabilities. So in our example, in our example, the current assets are $30, $30 million. We're gonna divide that by our current liabilities, which is six and a half million. And we would get uh, a current ratio of 30 million divided by six and a half million equals, wow, you know, this, this uh, corporation is pretty, uh, doing pretty good, 4.6 to 1. And so what that means is we have uh, $4.60 in current assets for every uh, dollar that we uh, owe uh, current assets divided by current liabilities. Now, another thing we get asked about is the quick ratio. Now, these are liquidity things. You know, working capital is about the liquidity of the corporation. Current ratio is about the a liquidity of the corporation. Another one we get a test, a test on is the acid test or quick ratio. And uh, this is very similar, very similar to what we just did, except as we said, we don't want to have to turn the inventory into cash. And so here it's the same formula, but now we're going to divide by instead of the current assets, the quickest quick assets. Now, as you recall, the quick assets were the current assets less the uh, inventory, right? So we're going to divide the quick assets by the current liabilities. And so in this example, boom, we have uh, quick assets of 15 million. And we're going to divide that by our current liabilities again, which is six and a half million. And again, that will establish our quick ratio. Ratio always means division, by the way. So 
I would joke. I'm, you know, I'm not really joking. I'm kind of joking. But if you can't decide what to do on the test, I see I have a typo here. It should say C, current liabilities. Another cup of coffee. <laughs> Um, I'm not being facetious. My arithmetic is terrible, so I'm going to use my calculator. 15 million divided by 6.5 million. Uh, we have uh, $2.30, $2 $2.31 for every dollar we owe. Again, this is, seems to be so far a very liquid uh, corporation. All right, so uh, we are done with our liquidity ratios, working capital, uh, current ratio, uh, quick ratio. Let's move on on the balance sheet and let's talk about these long-term liabilities. So we sold some convertible bonds. I can't stress this to you enough. Whenever you get a conversion price, whenever you get a conversion price on any of these exams, you have to establish a conversion ratio. It is much more important for us to know. Let me get a bigger font here. It's much more important for us to know how many shares we can get of these bonds, or in this case, from the issuer's perspective, how many new shares are we going to have to issue uh, based on this, perhaps, right? So that conversion price is 50. So the way we're going to get established the conversion ratio, very important as a test taker, is we're going to take par, and in a bond, that's going to be a thousand. And we're going to divide by the conversion price, which in this case is 50. Now be careful because remember, ladies and gentlemen, if this is a convertible preferred stock, par is a hundred. It's very important that you know par for preferred is a hundred and for bonds, it's a thousand. So if I take that uh, there and I divide, let me get a color we haven't used yet. Uh, so thousand divide by 50, I find out that uh, each of these bonds can be converted into 20 shares. So what that means is, you know, uh, it says 20 years, but you know, you can convert whenever you'd like. However, uh, you know, if I were your broker, I'd say, well, why are you gonna convert? I'm just trying to find us a right color here. Yeah, let's put it in, let's put in that, that sounds up a little bit. Um, we're going to ask you, do you want your $1,000 back or do you want 20 shares? Now, this represents potential dilution. And so the existing shareholders had to vote in favor of this. Now, I want to see how many shares that potentially represents. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the $40 million, That's what we got when we sold the bonds par in the primary market. I'm going to divide by par 1000 and the reason I'm doing that is I want to see how many bonds that that is, because I want to see how much potential dilution is there, right? Because these are, uh, could, it, by the way, it, at the end of the term, people are going to either say, give me a thousand or give me 20 shares. If 20 shares is worth more than a thousand, then they're going to say, give me the shares. If 20 shares isn't worth a thousand, they're going to say, give me the uh, my principal back. And then again, the issuer could do a forced conversion by offering you a call. And again, if that call price isn't as good as the stock price in terms of uh, parity, you're going to have to calculate parity, by the way. But anyways, if it's not as good, then you'd make that decision. So anyways, let's see how many uh, potential shares this is. We've got uh, $40 million worth of bonds. Uh, we divide by 1,000. And we find out that's 40,000 bonds. So we're going to put that there. And then the reason that's important for me, uh, again, is because what I want to know is what is the potential, what is the potential issuance of those shares, right? So if there's 40,000 bonds and they can be inverted into 25 uh, shares or 20 shares, excuse me, 20 shares, we're looking at the potential of uh, let's see how many more new shares that would be. So 40,000 bonds times 20 shares. Uh, we're looking at a potential of 800,000 more shares. You know, so, you know, sometimes we're going to be interested in like, okay, what does the business look like if all these potential owners choose to become owners? 
right? Because these are people who are right now bondholders, but if they want, they can switch their status into becoming uh, shareholders. So there's a potential 800,000 new shares that can be issued here. Okay, so uh, it's 8%. That's the coupon or the nominal yield. So we could also figure out, uh, you know, how much in interest we're going to be paying each year, right? So we've got uh, $40 million that will be paid semi-annually times 8%. And it looks like, look, uh, 40 million times 8%. So it looks like that's uh, 3, 3,200,000 we're going to owe in some interest. As you see here, now we're into the net worth category of the balance sheet. We've got preferred stock. You should definitely know preferred stock has par value of 100. I wouldn't worry that common stock is a buck, but I would worry about par for preferred being 100. You know, because you're going to get asked about the difference between, for example, par value, I'll just make up an answer set here, which we're discussing right now. Uh, we're going to be, you know, concerned about market value. That's a supply-demand relationship in the uh, secondary market. Book value, I'm not going to make you crunch book value. But as I said, book value represents the theoretical liquidation value of the business. What we mean by that is we took all the assets that we're looking at, we liquidate them. We then pay off all the liabilities, what would be left over. Now, as I said, in doing that calculation, which is not testable, by the way, this isn't as testable as I think people who are worried about it think. But, you know, the, one of the reasons is the test assumes that you're an intermediary, that somebody else is doing this. The research department, you know, somebody else. And what we're doing here is, what we call fundamental analysis, where uh, I'm going to say you're a fundamentalist doesn't mean you're a member of the religious right. It means we either are starting by doing bottom up, looking at this company, its financial statements, and then deciding about the industry, the economy, or top down, the economy, industry stock, you know, whichever way we choose to go about it. Uh, capital in excess of par, who cares? You know, but if we're looking at this, if common stock was a dollar par and you know, we could kind of say, okay, well, it looks like there's 10 million shares. Let's just assume there's 10 million shares outstanding. Retained earnings is 18. That's money that we didn't distribute to the shareholders. So when the board meets, we decide, you know, how much we're going to distribute to the shareholders, which is how much is we're going to keep to run the business, right? We might, you know, as a board decide and at the end of the third quarter, because we haven't gone through the income statement yet, is to decide of the earnings available to common, how much we're going to distribute to the owners, shareholders and how much we're going to plow back into the business. All right, one more formula here about solvency. Solvency. So if we, you know, file chapter 11 bankruptcy, that's reorganization. Chapter 7 is liquidation. And you should definitely uh, know senior to junior the securities. The most senior security is secured debt. I don't see any secured bonds here as we look at the balance sheet. I don't see any mortgage bonds or any equipment trust certificate bonds or any uh, uh, collateral trust bonds. So it looks like these bonds here are convertible to ventures. So then it would be unsecured debt, then preferred stock, and then common stock. Now, one thing in terms of solvency is how much debt do we have on the balance sheet? So we might want to compare debt uh, and divide that debt. We have debt here of $40 million and divide that by our total capital to see how much leverage is involved in the business. So our total capital here is uh, 93.5. I'll get, take care of that in just a sec. But remember, corporations uh, capitalize themselves with equity and debt. So of the money that's involved in running this business as of today, let me just label that, not all this belongs to the shareholders. Uh, by the way, equity always precedes debt. You can't have any debt till you have equity in terms of capitalizing a corporation. So uh, debt to total cap. So where did I get the total cap? Let me get on my thing again. Total capitalization is the bond money. That you know That's what we're using to capitalize the business and then the net worth of the corporation. And so that's where I'm getting that 93,500,000. Uh, kind of kind of intuitive. But the more leverage we have on the balance sheet and the less equity we have, we are said to trade on equity. Trade on equity would be a corporation that has a smaller sliver of equity and a large amount of debt. For example, utility companies have a large amount of debt on their balance sheet. So sometimes we say they trade on equity, meaning they're sensitive 
to interest rates. And then again, it's also about flexibility of business. The more debt we have, the less flexible the business is. And so let's uh, figure out what this is. We're going to take our $40 million in bond money. We're going to divide by 93.5. And we find out that uh, 42 cents of every dollar involved in running this business belongs to the bondholders and not the owners of the business. So again, it's again about solvency. So we had three liquidity ratios or three things that involve liquidity, working capital, current ratio, acid test or quick ratio. And then we have a, another ratio here that's about the solvency of the business. Yeah, the, the more debt you have on the balance sheet, you know, the <laughs> bigger the prospect of uh, bankruptcy, right? So less debt you have. Again, think of your personal situation. You know, I can't go bankrupt because I don't owe anybody any money. So, you know, <laughs> you know that's then you might find that's that's you know silly not to have any debt, but you know, to each their own, right? If I when I was a younger person, I had a lot of debt, I had a lot of debt. So corporations are uh, persons too, as Mitt Romney said, they're just unnatural persons. Okay, as I said, you probably should be able to do this for you know have a general understanding of this balance sheet for for the test as well as. Uh, you know, being able to, to tell with customers, say, hey, you know, what I'd like to do is kind of get, take a picture in time of where you're at today, you know, by doing a personal balance sheet, and we can revisit this, and uh, hopefully we can get that net worth up. Okay, so the other uh, part of the financial statements that we're interested in is the income statement. So let's uh, go through the income statement. Just let me uh, look this over, just make sure I haven't missed anything here. Yeah, I think good enough. I mean, I'm probably doing, if anything, overkill. We're into this for 30 minutes. So here's XYZ Corporation. It says month ending. But remember, we don't have to report the month. What we report, I basically just grabbed a, a balance sheet and income statement to you know do this little uh, carve out. So uh, XYZ Corporation, income statement, month ending. But we would have to do it quarterly, right? So quarterly, remember, is how often we're doing it. So you probably heard of this before. You probably have heard of this before, but, you know, colloquial, we say, what is the top line? The top line is revenue, right? So you probably heard of that term before, the top line. And then the bottom line, what is the bottom line? So as we go through this, you know, is that bottom line going to be positive or not? Right? So on this income statement, we have uh, our sales, 85 million in sales. We have costs of goods sold of 20 million. So, you know, that's what, you know, our, by the way, I doubt we're going to get into margins and stuff like that on, you know, again, it's somebody else's job to do that, but it uh, looks like we have pretty good margin here. Woo. <laughs> you know, that's a pretty good uh, margin. Anyways, operating costs of 10 million. So operating profit of 55 million. So, you know, this is a fictitious uh, balance sheet, but boy, I'm, I'm definitely interested in XYZ. This looks like a, a pretty profitable uh, operation. Uh, Non-operating income is things we make from other things, right? So in not operating the business. This could be from, you know, our investments. It could be from uh, something that is not, you know, germane to actually what we're doing. Um, what would be an example of this? Uh, oh, for example, uh, you know, Dean, let's say uh, I do a tutoring. And then on the YouTube channel you're watching, I get ad sets. So, you know, what am I considering to be my main thing? Is it tutoring or is it AdSense? It's it's not a function of operating the business. Uh, interest before in, earnings before interest in uh, taxes is fifty seven million. Uh, interest expense on our bonds. Now remember, if those bonds are convertible, so if we assume that the bonds we're looking at are convertible and the people convert, either a forced conversion where we make the economics such that they're going to convert, or whether it's the end of the uh, term and we ask them, do you want X number of shares? Or do you want your, your principal back? You know, what we're hoping is they say, let's convert. So again, having a general understanding of what's going to happen on the income statement, if we assume, we, we're not told here whether this is convertible debt or not, but let's assume it is for purposes of the test and this discussion. And so if people convert, please note that $5 million goes poof and more money will fall to the bottom line. So one thing we're sometimes concerned with was is called fully diluted earnings per share. What we mean by fully diluted earnings per share is 
let's assume that everybody who can convert does so. And earnings would go up, but so would the share count, right? We're going to have more shares to split the money with. So I'd have a general understanding of that. So we have taxable income. The interest you pay on the bonds is deductible. So that's $52 million. Uh, we owe $17 million in taxes. So our net income after taxes is $35 million. Now, remember, very testable, we have to take care of the preferred stockholders. You cannot pay a dividend to common until we take care of the preferred stockholders. Preferred stocks, remember, have preferential treatment in two areas, dividends and liquidation. So, you know, we're having our board meeting. So, you know, we meet each quarter of the board. And we're reviewing our results, the quarterly results. And I say, okay, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, board members, we have $34 million, uh, two available to common. You know, do we want to declare a dividend? Now, you don't have a right to a dividend unless it's declared. You know, if, you know, we don't declare that dividend, then you have no right to it, right? But they say, yeah, let's declare a million dollars worth of dividends. You know, I said, wow, geez, yeah, that's pretty stingy. <laughs> I'm joking. It's a very profitable business, but, you know, a million dollars of that. So that means we're going to keep 33,200,000, uh, you know, to build the business. Uh, but let's suppose there's uh, 10 million shares outstanding. So I'm just making that up, but we had uh, 30... Uh, for and uh, earnings available to common, and we have. I'm just assuming we had 10 million shares. I just made that up. Remember the previous slide, we said let's just assume that. And so, what I'm trying to establish here is earnings per share. So, 34 million, 200,000. Divide by 10 million shares. Uh, that's three dollars and forty-two cents in earnings per share. Earnings per share. Now I'm gonna kind of do this a little bit uh backwards. What I mean by a little bit backwards is I'm gonna, you know, kind of reverse engineer this. So maybe I propose to the board. I say, you know, what I think we should do is be a little more generous in terms of distributing excess capital to our shareholders. I know that this quarter is over, but moving forward, I would like to propose a dividend payout ratio, a dividend payout ratio of 50%. I think we should tell our shareholders that we're going to keep 50% uh, of the earnings to build the business, and we're going to uh, pay out 50%. So if you say, gee, uh, well, what would that mean? I said, well, in this example, 50% uh, dividend payout, which would mean we would pay $1.71, half of that. And, you know, we take the dividend. This is, again, testable dividend payout ratio. I just made up this payout ratio, but you should be prepared to tell me on the test that that would be a dividend payout ratio of 50%, Right. I said, moving forward, I think we should declare a dividend uh, payout ratio 50. So whatever the earnings are, we're going to tell shareholders that they get a percentage of that. Uh, some boards do that. Some, some it's discretionary. Some it's a, it's a quarterly dividend that is uh, consistent. But we should know that we associate uh, higher dividend payout ratios with more mature, stable businesses. So basically, this company has got to kind of justify that it needs to keep this much money to build the business. And there might be opportunities for them to do that. But, you know, otherwise they might have people saying, well, gee, why don't you give that money to the owners so we can decide what to do with it? But anyways, I would have a general understanding of this concept of the dividend payout ratio. And again, a concept about, you know, we associate dividends with mature, stable businesses. They can afford, you know, they don't need all the money that they're making to, you know, build the business. So, boom. Now, another thing that we should be aware of that relates to this, it's not found on the financial statements, kind of a trick question, right? What's not found on any of these uh, documents, any of these things we've been talking about is the market price of the stock. You know, and the reason we're concerned with the market price of the stock is because another thing that we're held accountable for is called the P.E. ratio the price to earnings ratio. You know, we use this to uh, measure uh, and compare companies. 
You know, so for example, maybe I tell you that the current market price of the stock, the current market price of the stock is $68.40. I just made that up to illustrate this uh, concept. And so one thing I might ask you is to take the price, what is the price to earnings ratio on the corporation that we're looking at? And so price to earnings, we're going to take the price, we're going to divide it by our earnings. So let's just label everything here. Here's our current market price. And we're going to divide that by our earnings. As you recall, our earnings was... Uh, Three dollars and forty-two cents. We'll put that in a different color. And we would establish by doing those uh, what is called the PE ratio. All right, so PE. Whoop. So I'm gonna take my calculator. I'm gonna take uh, sixty-eight forty. Whoop, 6840, I'm going to divide by the 342, and I find out the P-E ratio is 20. So what that means is that in theory, it's going to take me 20 years to get back in earnings what I paid uh, for the stock. And again, we would use this uh, for comparisons, right? If this is uh, XYZ is trading at 20 times earnings, and its competitor is trading at uh, 15 times earnings. There's two schools of thought. One is that you should buy the lower PE if you're a value investor, or that uh, there's a justification for paying 20 times earnings because maybe you think the earnings are going to grow, but it's used as a comparison. You know, if we're uh, in a private business that's going public and it's in a similar business of XYZ, we say they're trading in the yeah, marketplace at a PE multiple of 20. We should be able to take you public at something close to that. Okay, so I hope you found this little, uh, what I think we brought this in, you know, well, geez, close to 40 minutes, but hope you find it helpful. Let me get rid of uh, this. Remember, inch by inch, your exams are a cinch. Yard by yard, your exams are hard. And so I will be putting this in the uh, Series 7 uh, playlist, the 65 playlist, and the 66 playlist. See you next time.